Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I am so excited today because I have Dr. Christina Holland on with us. And if you're tired of dealing with the limitations of pain and linking around sex or any kind of pelvic floor dysfunction, then you are in for a treat with this episode. She is an expert and really, I love the mission of her business, which is really to allow access for people to have individualized healthcare that really helps them feel confident in their ability to live life without leaking and have pleasurable sex because- those are important things. <laughs> so thank yeah, you I know you're all about that and I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. So welcome. And I really, I want to share a little bit about your story because I hear this often from women is, you know, sometimes when you go through the regular rigmarole of medical care, you might get dismissed or your symptoms can be just written off. And so I really want, I think that's so important to talk about and one of your passions of why you started doing what you do. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your why. Yeah, I don't mind at all. So when I was actually in physical therapy school, I needed to have a pelvic surgery. So I had a urethral diverticulum, which is basically a cyst or an, an out, outcropping, excuse me, in my urethra that needed to be closed. And so it involved a surgery through my vagina, through my urethra, and I had to wear a catheter for 30 days. So it was a pretty big undertaking for someone, for anyone. I was in my mid, my mid twenties. And I realized through that process that I didn't feel like I could get my questions answered. I didn't feel like my provider really gave a crap about me, to be honest. Like at the very beginning, I was just so grateful to have some sort of plan. But then postoperatively, when I was having all these complications and things weren't going as well, I didn't feel like she was there for me. And I am a white cisgender work person, cisgender woman with I had private insurance. I was literally learning to be a pelvic floor physical therapist. So I spoke the medical language. I had lots of things on my side and I still couldn't get the, the care and the level of care that I needed. And so it just made, really opened my eyes to what that can look like for people who have no idea how to navigate the medical system. I mean, it's such a scary situation oftentimes because you know I feel like on both sides, there's just overwhelm and questions. And then oftentimes from the provider side, they're just so busy. They don't really, I mean, they are just trying to get through their day. And mm -hmm. like you say, it's like that, even with so much privilege, not getting the care you need. And so I love that you are so inclusive and, you know, I'd love if you could just share a little bit more about what you can do around painful sex. Cause oftentimes people just think they're resigned. This is going to be a thing. I'm just going to like get my partner off all the time or mm -hmm. just you know, resolve that this is just an area of my life I have to say goodbye to, which isn't the case. And so I'd love if you'd share more about, about what you can do. Yeah. So something that's good to know is that if you've had painful sex in the past and you have a history of painful sex, it now lowers the threshold and makes it easier for you to have painful sex in the future. So I like people to know that because I think there's a lot, people start to think that it's like I'm making it up or I'm being dramatic or it's all in my head or I'm crazy. And none of those things are true. There are very physiological things that are occurring that make you more likely to have painful sex after you've had painful sex multiple times. So I like people to know that first and foremost. That being said, some things that are like, that are pretty accessible to do is one would be to use lubricant, right? Using a good quality lubricant, making things really slippery, reducing friction as much as possible, changing positions. So sometimes depending on if you have pain with initial penetration or pain with deeper penetration, I think I, something I commonly see be really helpful is like a doggy style position or a like cowgirl sort of position where you're, where the person with the vagina is on top. One, it gives you more control. So that's really helpful. You can kind of figure out if you want to be really deep or not. And it also widens your hips, which makes it a little, gives you a little bit more space inside of your vaginal opening, which can be less uncomfortable. The other thing is that people skip foreplay when, when people know that pain is going to be, or sex is going to be painful, but they want to have sex because they want to be intimate with their partner. They want to meet their partner's needs. People will rush through it or moms with new babies, right? Parents with new babies. They're like, oh, we are on a schedule. We got things to do they'll rush through it and skip foreplay. And that doesn't allow the vulva to get as much blood flow as it really needs to have a good time. So it's kind of like trying to put a half flaccid penis inside a vagina. Like you can do it, but it's not going to be that fun. It's so true. And I just, you know, to speak to a couple of things you just mentioned, which, you know, number one, using lube, because there is such a fa fallacy out there that you have to be wet to be turned on, or that if you're wet, you know, that means you're turned on, which neither of those things are true. And so, yes, I think there's often sometimes people feel guilty that they have to use lube. And I say, find something you love 
and use it all the time because it's so good for, you know, like you say, in, increasing glide and just also helping with moisturization. Sometimes if you find one that you don't, you know, obviously one that's skin friendly and doesn't have all the bad chemicals. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then also too, yeah, about the being on the time schedule and just being in a rush, because I think that is such a problem. And especially now too, because so many people are just stuck together all the time that there's a lack of excitement in general. Yeah. Totally. So yes, the foreplay. Oh, thank you for this. Yes. Yeah. You're like, I can't miss it if you don't go away. Right. So when you're, when you're together all the time, it can be really hard to go from like co like office mates and roommates and co-parents to then like a sexual romantic partner, someone that I'm really excited to get naked with and, and interact with. Yeah. And I know, you know, there's obviously many things that you can do. Oftentimes there's many causes of help pelvic pain and sexual pain. So, you know, I want you to know that there's solutions. And the other thing I love about pelvic floor therapy, I think it's such an, it's such an important, I think every human could use it, but yet we're never really taught a lot about it or unless, you know, maybe you haven't had a baby and they're like, maybe you should go to the pelvic floor therapist. And even then that's not always recommended mm -hmm. like in other countries where it's like just part of the postpartum care. Right. So I would love, you know, just to speak to that for a moment. Totally. So becoming a pelvic floor physical therapist totally changed my own concept of what my body does, what it is, how it works, how it works sexually. And I've seen that in my patients as well. So for example, I just had a patient who is only having some, she just kind of wanted a wellness check. She wanted to make sure things were working as she, as she hoped they were. I see some people like preconception and they're like, Hey, I just want to, I want this to be in a, a well-oiled machine. What do I need to do? What do I need to know? And so people come in, not really with any symptoms, but people have no idea what to expect. Like what even is the pelvic floor, you know, talking about how it's a sling of muscles, how those muscles work just like any other muscle and what to expect when you're aroused, like your vulva should change color and, and your clitor should become enlarged and bigger when you're physically, physiologically aroused, right? What does it take to do that? What does it mean if I'm not getting wet? What does it mean if I am getting wet all the time? Like, so there's just so much missing from our education about what our bodies are doing. And then in addition, we feel so shameful because our culture speaks about it in such a shameful way that the only thing genitals could possibly be used for is intercourse or toileting. And those things are both things that we just don't talk about. So we either get people who are terrified that there's something deeply wrong with them and they're broken when really th their bodies are behaving just how they're, how they're meant to, or we get people who are living with lots of like leaking or discomfort or pain, and then just have no idea that it could be different. You know, something that I'd love to hear you share about, because I know, you know, say you are having some of these issues. I mean, also too, just things like back pain and, you know, digestive issues can so be connected to the pelvic floor too. And people often don't like connect all the dots there, but there's a lot happening in this area. Oh, for sure. 60, so 65%, uh, we have some literature that says that 65% of cisgender women who have SI joint pain also have pelvic floor dysfunction. Like in the grand scheme of research, 65% is, is huge. It's ginormous. And so that's a very common thing that gets missed when people are regularly going to see a chiropractor or a DO or a physical therapist for low back or persistent hip pain that doesn't re isn't resolving and the pelvic floor just gets completely written off. So that's definitely something that's useful to know. And then pelvic floor muscles have, not only do they need to be strong, they also need to be in control and they need to be coordinated. So if you're not able to control your pelvic floor in, in a coordinated way, it's going to make it hard for you to have a bowel movement, for instance, and you might have constipation related to that. You could have painful bowel movements. It might make it hard for you to urinate fully, or you might urinate all the time when you don't mean to. And all of that can have a pelvic floor contributor. And with regards to... I'm sure when you work in the field of, you know, sexual dysfunction and kind of helping people recover with regards to moving through painful sex and perhaps getting their libido back and all those things. I'd love to share a little bit more about, you know, the importance of like treating the, the pain first before you can move forward, because it is true, you know, even if you're in a loving partnership and there has been penetration at times where you didn't want to, or like you say, you're rushing through or trying to please the other party then you can build up the trauma there. So yeah, I'd love to hear you share more about that. Yeah, for sure. So a couple of things I see people. So one of the questions on my intake form is, do you have decreased arousal or libido? And is that bothersome, right? Because some people that like, they do have decreased libido and they're fine with it. They're like, I'm good. I am getting my needs met. I'm just as happy not having those particular needs. It's fine. And that's not a problem. And there are people who are like, no, I definitely have decreased libido and it really bothers me. Something that's good to know is, are you one, setting yourself up well to have good sex? 
because if you're, if you're having really mediocre sex or if your sex, especially if your sex is painful, like nothing about your brain is going to go. Yeah. I want to do that some more. So people, I think sometimes seek alternative options, whether that is like a pharmacological option or they go into sex therapy and all of those can be great options. But if you're having physical pain from the muscles of your pelvis, it doesn't matter what drugs you give your brain. Like you're very unlikely to convince it that they, it still wants to do this thing. That's going to really hurt. Yeah. And those drugs aren't always effective and have bad side effects. No. I mean, I've had a urogynecologist on recently who was talking about, I think it was Addy in particular, but just, you know, there is a great marketing for it, yep. but I mean, yay for the placebo effect. There is something to that if yeah. it works for you, but also, you know, often you have to, to, to work at the root of things. And, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So let me ask you this. If someone is looking to get additional pelvic floor care and they're struggling to find resources, how can you direct them? Because there's people you know, all over the world that listen to this podcast. So I'd love if you would maybe share some tools in that area even. Totally. So if you're in the US, I would look up Academy of Pelvic Health, uh, find a provider. And so that is a whole list of people in the United States and you will hopefully be able to find someone near you in that way. There, another website is going to be pelvic, I would Google pelvic guru directory, and that has some more global resources for finding a pelvic floor physical therapist near you, or you could just Google pelvic floor physical therapist near me. Sometimes that's successful. Sometimes it isn't. And depending on if you're, if you're elsewhere in the world, other than the U S it, it very much depends on like what the healthcare system near you has available. I am super happy to chat with people online. I'm hoping that my Instagram comes back. They were messing with me this morning, oh, but no. yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's because I talk about sex online and they don't like it. I, it's really hard to say. But my name, Christina.Holland. Assuming I still have an Instagram account, I'm super happy to chat with you that way. And I put out a lot of information and share a lot of stuff to my stories from other pelvic floor physical therapists as well. Yeah. And Christina, you have an amazing Instagram account. So I sure hope they don't take it away. I have to say, unfortunately, being in this industry, they, they're not supportive of anything that is sexually empowering or around pel the words pelvis, the words, you know, sex, any kind of Flitter genital or genitals. Or, yeah. yeah. So it's unfortunate because like the good information that needs to get out there to people isn't. Thankfully we have other ways, but anyway, I just have to say, it's just really fun and playful how you always are sharing. So I love your Instagram account. You know, one of the things that I think is interesting, because oftentimes people will notice certain things happening and maybe they aren't quite ready to reach out for help, or maybe they have, uh, they're embarrassed too. So maybe you could share some tips in that area, because like you say, these are areas we don't talk about. And sometimes people don't like to necessarily admit that they need to, or want to um, do work in this area. Yeah. And sometimes people have brought it up and they've either been shamed by providers, which is awful and unacceptable, or they've just been dismissed. So a couple of things I just want people to know, if you bring something up to your provider and they dismiss you or shame you or ignore it completely, they, I, they probably have their own work that they need to do. That is not a reflection of you. That's not a reflection of your body or the way that it works. It's not a reflection of anything besides what your provider is unfortunately bringing into the room with them. And that's not on you. So I like to make that extraordinarily clear. And then the other thing is sometimes providers just don't know what to do, right? Like it's not that they don't want to help you. It's just that they don't know that pelvic floor physical therapy is a thing. Like, I don't know why that still is not well known, but it isn't. So I would bring up, can I see a pelvic floor physical therapist? Do you know anyone? If you have issues with pain in your vulva, vagina, like lower abdomen, pain during intercourse, leaking, prolapse or heaviness symptoms, like just bring it up to your provider. Can I see a pelvic floor physical therapist? Do you know someone? If the idea, I do have people who reach out to me online that are like, I couldn't possibly talk about this with anyone. I live in a small town. Everyone knows each other. They'll either ask me questions or I also have a, like a playbook for painless sex on my website. And sometimes if you're like, please don't make me talk to another human, that would be a good place to start. I, I lay out a bunch of strategies that I commonly give patients and that's on my website. Beautiful. And I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well. And I'm wondering, you know, moving towards, you know, say you're struggling with incontinence or leaking, what would be some tips that you could share around that? Yeah. So if, especially if you're kind of newly postpartum or you've had kids in the last couple of years, and it's, it's more often than just when you're sneezing cough or coughing, Kegels are, is not a bad place to start. Kegels are not the be all end all of incontinence treatment. And certainly if you start to do them consistently, 
and your leaking gets worse, stop doing them. Or if you do them consistently and it doesn't change, go see a pelvic floor physical therapist. A Kegel is just a pelvic floor muscle contraction. It just means that the muscles in your pelvis are turning on and sometimes that, and that can increase strength, uh, which can super be, be very helpful when it comes to incontinence, unless the problem is not that you're weak, but actually that your muscles are on all the time, in which case Kegels are not going to help you. Right. Which is sometimes why you need to see a professional. But if someone you know, maybe doesn't have the resources to, how would they mm-hmm. just check on their own? Like, how do I know? Yeah. So you can do it a couple of ways. So if you feel comfortable putting something inside of your vaginal canal, like your finger, what you're feeling for is you're feeling for a squeeze and a lift and you should be able to hold it for like eight to 10 seconds. And the way that I test is I normally test people 10 times. Most people can't actually hold it for 10 seconds, 10 times. That doesn't mean that you're doomed to leak for forever. So I just like to give people that caveat. If touching your own genitals is not accessible to you, but you feel like you can look at them, then you can use a mirror and you're looking to see if your vagina or per- the perineum, the the space between your vagina and your rectum comes up towards your head when you do a Kegel. Beautiful. I always like to just share that because oftentimes people might not be realizing if they're doing them right or wrong or if it's harmful or not. So, and I think that's so interesting because I think, you know, and I did have really good birth care. I had midwives and they were amazing. And I feel like because of that, they gave me more information than normal. But even Mm -hmm. so, like I did my own work to try to find pelvic floor therapy, just because I know how important it is. And so I just want to, you know, I feel like every human, literally every human can benefit. So (laughs) I, um, I don't disagree with you. (laughs) Yeah. And one thing uh, that I just thought of around that, if you are doing a Kegel and you, when you look in the mirror, your perineum is actually coming down like towards the mirror. I highly recommend seeing someone at that point, because that means that your system is like totally flipped on its head. And that is something that can contribute to issues kind of in the longer term, potentially. So that would be something that I think another misconception is that pelvic floor physical therapy, I have to go in and see someone twice a week for like 16 visits or something. I have, I see people all the time who are like a one and done that they just want more information. They want to know what should, what's normal. What should they expect? Are they doing it? Are they not doing it? What's the next move? And then we like send them on their way. Uh, like the person who I just saw who was trying to conceive, saw her once and hopefully I'll see her in the postpartum period. You know, hopefully she has a, a great pregnancy and I see her after. Right. And then I'd love, you know, because when you're talking about when your organs perhaps start to prolapse, I know people have heard this term. Maybe people aren't familiar with what that is. So maybe you could Talk a little bit more about prolapse and when it's a good idea to see a pelvic floor therapy in that arena. Sure. So prolapse is something that we see pretty commonly, especially postpartum, although you don't have to have been pregnant to have prolapse. What we're talking about with that is that your pelvic organs, which is your bladder, uterus, and rectum, assuming those are the organs that you have, will actually move and descend, especially during vaginal delivery. So some amount of pelvic organ descent is normal in the postpartum period. And then we would hope to see that it would kind of reduce when all the ligaments and everything kind of come back together. Sometimes it doesn't reduce. What we know from the research is that you can have prolapse, so you can have your bladder or your bowel or your uterus kind of falling down into the vaginal canal, which sounds very terrifying. And I will tell you right now that if you Google prolapse, it's very scary. But I will also tell you that the reality is, that is not as scary as the internet makes it seem. So with that. Um, like most things, right? <laughs> right, right. It's, but you're like, oh my God, my organs are going to come out of my body. That sounds awful. I agree. It does sound awful. I will also tell you it isn't always awful. So from the research, we know that people can have really significant, clinically significant, like we can see the organs descend quite a lot, prolapse and not have any symptoms at all. So you kind of have to differentiate what is actually symptoms of the organs falling and what is the pelvic floors, what are symptoms related to the pelvic floors response to those organs falling. So if you have prolapse, if you have a long-standing history of constipation and you are postpartum or even prepartum, honestly, for especially for people who have a long-standing history of constipation where you've had to like strain a lot, I highly recommend seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist to give you some, some tools and strategies that you can onboard pre-delivery. And I think it's good too, because I mean, really there's not a bad, as you age, you know, you can use support because even as we just age, the prolapse can start to happen. And just yeah. like we, in our society, like we sit so much, all the things that aren't great So even, you know, from that perspective, you know, say you do sit at a desk all day or you aren't getting around as much as you'd like moving wise, what would be some tips that you could offer just that you could do on a regular basis to, for your pelvic floor health or just for your, your muscles and anatomy in general? 
Totally. Well, so you could start doing Kegels, right? Like if you were concerned about it, if you started having the heat, you could start doing Kegels. But what would be more fun than Kegels would be having orgasms, which is basically a series of pelvic floor muscle contractions that's just way more entertaining. So rather than doing Kegels every day, if you could have an orgasm every day, it might be a bit easier into your schedule. I love it. And that is a lot more fun way. (laughs) There's numerous ways to make that happen. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, Um, exactly. And, you know, from alternatively too, you know, you mentioned if you have a lot of tension, if you have, you know, you're, you're very tight in your pelvic floor, what would be some advice that you could share in that area? Yeah. So deep breathing into your abdomen, letting your belly go because we live in this, you know, Western beauty ideal society where being thin is, seems to be of the utmost importance. And we could all be on someone's camera phone at any time. Spend a lot of time sinking our, our belly buttons to our spine and sucking it all in. And muscles need to be able to contract, but also elongate. And we're not letting our belly muscles do that. And our belly muscles and our pelvic floor muscles work very closely together. So taking big, deep breath, letting it all go, doing some, I've been having a lot of people dance recently, like if people like to dance and just shake, like shake their hips really hard, let the butt jiggle, let the vulva jiggle, let the thighs jiggle, let the belly jiggle. And it feels really ridiculous at first, but can actually be really, really excellent for decreasing some of that tension. I love that. I do love to move. So that's the thing, but I know for not everyone likes to do that. Yeah. Um, And it doesn't have to be for forever, right? Like you don't have to do like 30 minutes of a workout. It can literally be 30 seconds of just like letting everything go. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you know, what is the most common reason people come to you in particular? I think me specifically is probably, I see a lot of people who have extensive trauma histories and also have pelvic pain. So similar to the way that I, now that I've had bad health instances in healthcare as a patient myself, I'm very choosy about certain healthcare providers. Other people have had, unfortunately, similar experiences or totally different experiences that were also very impactful. And so people often will reach out to me because they want to know that their voice is going to be considered, that they're seeing someone who's trauma informed, that they have complete autonomy in a, in a visit that I'm not going to push them to do anything they're uncomfortable with, that they have a, a provider who's very communicative. So a lot of it has to do with that aspect. And just, I think that's important to point out because you're right. Not everyone, even, you know, everyone is different in the way they do their thing. So I'm grateful. Yeah. There's people like you that are amazing at it. <laughs> we are trying, I mean, so we're trauma-informed care is becoming a buzzword. Yes. And, and on one hand, that's good because it may, brings it more to, especially like consumers of healthcare, patients consciousness, and like knowing that that's a thing. And because it's not, it's not regulated, there's not like a certification or you can do certifications maybe, but they're like, totally independent. So trauma-informed care can mean lots of different things to different people. I have spoken with other providers who say that they do trauma-informed care. And then when I listen to their practices, I'm like, that is not how I would embody or, imp- or practice follow for, or um, trauma-informed care. Because to your point, like everyone has their own way of doing it. So my big, I get a lot of questions about how do I find someone trauma-informed? And my, my answer is ask, is mm-hmm ask the provider or maybe their front desk person, check out their website, send an email, you know, what does doing trauma-informed care mean to you? Can you provide me examples in which you provide trauma-informed care? If you have a specific marginalized identity, so if you are LGBTQIA 2S+, or if you are Black or Indigenous or, you know, whatever, I would ask questions about, do you work with people who have this identity? What does that look like? Like, And it's easier to do a lot of that either via email or on the phone than being in an office and then being surrounded by us in a situation that you feel like you don't have any control over. Right. And I think that's so key. And even, you know, when you are in the, as much as possible, you should be able to have some sovereignty in your visit. And I always say that even with your like regular gyno, like ask to go slow, ask, you know, I even ask, can I put the speculum in myself? Most of the times they will let me, I mean, I've obviously I go to the midwife, so they're pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. But I think, you know, if anyone has a problem with that, you know, especially if you have a trauma history, you, you can ask them to go slow. You can ask them to take their time. They might not like it, but they should respect your, your wishes. So yeah, it's really hard because it's like finding a provider is always very challenging and it can be expensive. And it's like, yeah. do they take my insurance if you have insurance? And all of that can become really complicated. And I think something that's important is just taking stock of what's really important to you. Sometimes it is worth going out of network and finding someone that you really trust. Sometimes that's just not an option. And so then just like really advocating for yourself and asking for what you need can be really helpful. I think 
being really clear about what you know that you need. I love it when people say things like, I don't want to do, I don't want to do any internal work. I'm like, great. That tells me a whole bunch of like, that gives me a lot of direction and gives me lots of ideas for other stuff we can do that doesn't involve that. And so then that question might be, I don't want to do internal work ever. Like, take it off the table, or I don't want to do internal work today. Like maybe I'm on my period and I just don't want to, or I, I had a really bad day. I had a fight with my partner and now I'm just in a bad mood. Can we do it another time? Right. Mm-hmm. All of that is super helpful and can really impact the way that you're able to show up in your appointment and then how your provider will, can show up as well. Beautiful. I love that so much. So that, you know, knowing what you want and need and being able to voice that, which, you know, can be challenging at times, but it's so it's key hard. to think about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a good point, right? It's like, it's really easy to say and it's really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, even when it comes to pelvic floor PT, what would be some things that you, you know, if someone's like, okay, now I'm definitely gonna go see a PT. What do I need to, what are the questions I should be asking myself? You know, why, you know, why would I want to do this? You know what I mean? Like if you want to get clear on what the things you need are, how could you go about doing that? Yeah, so I would ask one figure out what the thing that is driving your care is. So if even if that thing is like a fear you have in the back of your head that you only let yourself think of at night, you know, so I've seen people who maybe leaked a little bit, they're in their, you know, late 30s, early 40s, but their, their moms were in nursing homes because they were incontinent. And so what they're really afraid of is they're afraid that they're going to end up in an in, in a nursing home 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, because they can't hold their bladder. And so knowing that about yourself and being, you know, practicing asking that question, like, this is a concern of mine. Can you tell me what I can do? Anything I can do to keep that from happening. Be honest with yourself about what makes you feel comfortable or uncomfortable, either in a visit or like with touch. Some people do not do not do well with physical touch. Their systems just don't like it. They're like, the idea of a massage makes me want to vomit. There are some people who are like, I love massages, touch me all the time. And so there's a whole spectrum there. So knowing that about yourself and then knowing what it's worth to you to get the exam. So I'll tell people like, hey, there is a chance that this exam could possibly be triggering. Like for example, for people who have histories of trauma, you could be a little bit sore afterward. And then people get to decide, like you as a patient get to decide, do you, is, that, is the risk of that worth it to you today to get the information that I can tell you that you'll get or not? And either of those answers are valid. That's good advice. Yeah. And I'm wondering too, you get clear you kind of think about, all right, here's what's going to be okay for me. Here's what's not. Anything else as a provider you'd like people to share or to have for you? Yeah. No, you know, I don't, sometimes people are like, oh, do you ask about trauma histories? Or like, do I need to disclose my trauma in office? And the answer is always no. I don't need to know that. If I know, the trauma-informed care to me means that I'm always intentionally decreasing the risk that I will perpetuate harm or trigger someone. So I treat all people exactly the same, regardless of whether or not they have a trauma history or disclose that to me. But certainly like that, again, I can't guarantee that all people who say they practice trauma-informed care do the same thing. But that information can be helpful sometimes if you feel like it's relevant to you. Other things that can be helpful are just like being really specific, honestly, is like, I have pain with sex. Okay. Is it at the beginning of sex? Is it the beginning of penetration? Is it at the end of penetration? Is it in certain positions? So if you can spend a little time just being like a little bit of an investigator before you come into the office, sometimes that can be helpful. If you can't or you don't, I ask people all I ask people questions all the time and they're like, oh my gosh, I've never thought about it. And I just I ask the hardest questions. So that's also totally fine. Yes. And you know, I'm curious too, what would be if there is any specific message that you'd love the listeners to receive today or any perhaps question that you really would love to dive into more that maybe we haven't talked about yet? I, you know, the thing that's been coming up a lot recently is shame is like, there's so much shame around our genitals. There's so much shame around sex. There's shame around leaking. There's shame like people, a lot of people who are post, I've been seeing a lot of people who are postpartum and they come in and they're just like, my vagina feels broken. It feels like I'm not going to be able to do the things I used to be able to do for my partner. And there are just so many levels to that. Right. And so I think what really helps, how has helped me in my own sexual body shame. One is reading come as you are by Emily Nagowski. It's amazing. (laughs) I'm sure, I'm sure it's come up um, on your podcast. And then also like knowing about my body. So I highly recommend if you just want more information about what bodies should do during sex, like this thing happens, is that normal? Is it okay that I do that? 
Like I have people asking, am I more at risk at prolapse? If I bear down to squirt, like that's totally fine. I am so happy to answer questions like that in um, assessments and evaluations and things like that. So yeah, just the things that you're, that you feel like might be broken or wrong with you. If you can feel, find someone, whether it's a medical provider, someone, an expert, hopefully who you can share that with and shed a little light on it. I think it can make people can really change people's lives. And so I want that for you and me and all the listeners too. Yes. I love it. Shame is such a big thing that I work with so many clients on because it can just show up in so many ways. And, you know, it's not our fault. It's our culture really. And, but there are ways to move, move past it and ways that, and, and, and doable ways. Right. Yeah. And I do, I think come as you are such a great book. I've thankfully been able to have Emily on the podcast a couple of times talking oh. about the book and also burnout, which I think that's also connected. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Stre- like um, completing the stress cycle. Absolutely connected. Yes. I do also love the book, uh, Women's Anatomy of Arousal by Sherry Winston. Oh, I don't know that one. I'll look into it. It's a really good one. And she, you know, is a nurse midwife among other things. And she, but one of the interesting things that I found about reading that book, I think I was in my thirties when I read it. And I'm, you know, so like 15 years ago, I was blown away. I was like, I'm a well-educated person. And I had zero clue about some of these things. Like we just aren't taught about what our bodies do how they function specifically with women's anatomy, because a lot of that, even today, they are (laughs) scientifically arguing things that is just quite interesting to me. Yeah. There's not a lot of research. All the research have been done by white cis dudes. Like there's a lot, there's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But you, there is lots to learn. And also, you know, the book Vagina by Naomi Wolf. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's got some great research in there too, which I find so fascinating because often we just forget. I, I truly believe like our sexual well being and our sexual health is connected to our overall health because mm-hmm. typically, you know, we're, we're a whole being, right? It's hard to just section off parts of us. But I think that, you know, what is so important is really taking ownership of our own wellness and our own health, which often we have to do on our own. Totally. A book I I really like too is called The Vagina Bible by Dr. Jen Gunter. Mm -hmm. And so that's good. It's like an encyclopedia. So it's a little, I liked reading it cover to cover, but I, that's probably not how most people would use it. If you want to know something specific, it's nice to like reference, go to your your reference page and then check in with it. And it's well-researched and it's good stuff. Yeah. Perfect. I know she's interested. She's got some controversial things out. Like she's just very adamant about her way of doing things, which is is awesome. So she's not always open to alternative thoughts. No, I don't always love that about her, (laughs) but I do. That's a fair point. Yes. But the information in the book is good. Yeah. It's nice to have, if you want to know what Western medicine says about something, Yeah, it's a good reference. If you want to know like what other alternative options would be, it is not a good reference. (laughs) Beautiful. And is there anything else, you know, that's feeling really alive that you feel like any last words you'd like to share? Truly, I think just being, being empowered to be, be your own agent and have agency and autonomy in whatever circumstance you're in, whether that is at work, in your sexual life, in the doctor's office is so important. And just continuing to be trauma-informed, not only in healthcare, but recognizing, I think especially right now, we have this unfortunate opportunity to recognize that trauma is impacting everyone mm-hmm. and it's impacting everyone differently. And so we we have an opportunity to step up and decide that we're going to be intentional about reducing our potential for perpetuating harm and doing that as much as possible. Yes. Yes. Yes to that. And where is the best for every best place for everyone to connect with you if they want to learn more? So apparently email because Instagram is being, being whatever it is. So email is Christina, like my first name, K-R-Y-S-T-Y-N-A at inclusivecarellc.com and inclusivecarellc.com is my website. I have videos, I have a blog, that's all. You can get lots of information there. And I also have my playbook for painless sex on my website and I do some trauma-informed care webinars and those are also up on my website. Beautiful. And you do have, that's a beautiful resource. So congratulations on that. I know it's a lot of work and it looks beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm I'm excited about it. Hey, and you know, again, I'll make sure to put all these resources in the show notes. So thank you so much again, Dr. Christina, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Amanda. Yes. And we will see you all next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, this is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and 
the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends. Go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.